to War for the Dawn 2.0, who will fight the others, a.k.a. Warriors of the Long Night. That's right. Warriors of the Long Night. You know I wear my Golden State gear any chance I get. I got the warm-ups until I get warmed up, and then I got the... And I got the jersey underneath, so I'm ready to go. I'm gonna be making some Street Fighter jokes. Gonna be making some, some, uh, some, some sports jokes. It's lots of cross references today, folks. We're here to talk about more than thirty some odd, more than forty really characters who may be uh, in in involved in the War for the Dawn. And let me just double check my microphone to make sure I got the right one on. I do. Very good. Okay, um, yes, War for the Dawn 2.0. We went over the Valerian Steel Swords, of course, in the first War for the Dawn stream. And uh, we talked about where they were. We had a nice map. We had visuals. We had art. Um, we talked about all the known swords. We talked about the ones that were lost. A couple theories on ones that might resurface. Soviet Union 80s clubbing vibe. Thank you. I appreciate the commentary. I never know what decade I'm in. I'm I'm usually a little behind, and then it comes back around and catches up again. I, I still have baggy pants from the early 2000s, um, which I believe are now back in style. In any case, folks, we have more visual aids prepared today. It's going to be a visual aid intensive stream. I again, if you've just if you've uh, just swinging in and haven't you know been in and out of the channel, I know not everybody watches every video that I make. I have been raising the quality of the live streams lately. And uh, yeah, I've been doing a little more art, less less coughing and bird noise, and and just trying to keep a pro. So, thanks you guys for your support. You can support the uh, stream, of course. Everything I do here, keep this channel going with the PayPal link, um, such as or the uh, super chat function. PayPal is preferred. I get to keep 100 percent or very close to that. Uh, if you have, like I said, larger one or medium-sized one, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. I appreciate any support. Um, Mark has Mark Daniel has already sent me a PayPal uh, doing the smart thing, sending it in about 10 minutes before the stream starts. Good way to get your question in. Do you think Sir Jorah will play any special role in the War for the Dawn 2.0? Could he be a dark horse candidate to ride a dragon? Well, I don't know about the dragon riding, but I do very much suspect he will be. Uh, so let me just show you my visual aid that I've got ready. This is a Street Fighter Mortal Kombat style character selection screen, if you will. We're got a bunch of fighters down there. We're gonna we're gonna go through each one, and on top is a lovely piece of art by Fadli Ramdani. Got a bunch of his art ready today, and as you can see, this is essentially a version of the HBO uh, mission that John and crew went on north of the Wall. As I've said many times, um, the reason for the White Hunt was a little silly bringing a white back to King's Landing. However, strongly suspect there will be something similar in the books where John and Danny and probably a last hero's dozen head north of the wall, maybe all the way to the heart of winter uh, to do some important magical purpose. And I've compared it to Frodo. Uh, the Lord of the Rings climax has all the armies battling at the gates of Mordor, but Frodo and Sam, they've got to carry the ring behind enemy lines and do a magical errand in order to defeat the Dark One. And both both elements are needed, okay, um, in order to save the day. So one's not more important than the other. I very much think we'll have a similar situation where we'll be fighting the others all over Westeros, and we will have a battle stream to come to talk about all the places where the battles could be and how they could go. But the point is, there will be a fight against the others south of the Wall as the others advance south through Westeros, but I strongly suspect there will be a mission behind enemy lines. I'm calling this group the last watch, the last hero's watch, the long night's watch, anything like that, whatever whatever words come to my mouth when I start talking, um, that's what I'm talking about. The, the potential echo of the last hero, who, of course, journeyed north with 12 companions, seeking the children of the forest, uh, looking for magics to help defeat the others. So um, as we talk about these characters, we will I'll, I'll be talking about which ones you know we think could be in in that last hero's dirty dozen but also the role that these characters could play in the wider battle against the others, because like I said, both are important. And, um, and uh, we'll have, uh, like I said, we'll have, uh, we'll talk about, we'll talk about both. So um, where was I going with this? Uh, yes. Yeah, so journey North of the wall, 
Not exactly like on the TV show, but as you can see, some of the players that were involved with this, we got Tormund, Sir Jora, and uh, the Hound, and Barrick with John and Danny there. Obviously, Barrick is dead in the books, but those other three are three we're going to talk about today the Hound, Tormund, and Jora. Um, Tormund and Jora, in particular, are very likely to be going on such a mission north of the wall or at least to play a critical role against the others. So, yes, Mark Daniel, we will talk about Jora today. Absolutely. I'm looking like a bookie for illegal sports gambling. I'm enjoying all the sort of uh, conjecture here. This is good. Um, I am neither a bookie nor a gangster, but I just like tracksuits. That's really the thing. Mm. All right. So um, real quickly, I want to thank a few people on Twitter. The Red Eye of Starfall at Raven Mormont. Song of Brown and Orange at Sir Pounce the Third. Uh, at CAW Nithologist Liam B, Zap Truly Pratzuli, Angela Solon at Factually Angie, and um, anybody else who suggested people to talk about. Uh, there were a few that I missed. Um, and if, if I just read your name, that means you suggested somebody that I had forgotten until I saw your tweet or post. So thanks. Um, and Annalise, Annalisa Seidel from Facebook asks, Will there be an initiation rite for John's Dirty Dozen to swear them in? Green Zombie, original Night's Watch vibes. So, of course, the Green Zombie theory is part of this. And I talked about this in the Melisandre Secrets video just recently. The idea that potentially some or all of John's companions could be undead, likely fire-whited, um, but potentially cold-whited like cold hands if... if there's a way to rescue people that have been cold whited, which seems to be what happened to cold hands. Um, the whole point of the green zombies theory, the nut of it really is that zombies are the best people to journey North into the frozen dead lands. They are impervious to the cold. They are, they don't need to eat. They don't need to take shelter. Uh, they don't need to stay warm. Uh, so that's what we see with cold hands. He's very effective for ranging North of the wall in perpetuity, because again, it doesn't need any food. Um, John's going to be a fire white, most likely. So in the, in the fire whites watch video in particular, I talked about all the foreshadowing that Melisandre will be creating a little group of fire whites potentially at the wall to help John take on his mission. So as we talk about these characters, we will discuss the idea of some of them being whited. Um, I do think the weirwood grove of nine is a prime location to see green zombies made or night's watchmen raised from the dead or people raised from the dead who will become honorary night's watchmen if you will um the the weirwood grove of nine is where john takes his oaths there's a couple other some important scenes that go on there uh which we're going to discuss in a different war for the dawn stream where i talk about the symbolic foreshadowing scenes of the war for the dawn so weirwood grove of nine definitely a location where we could see something like that I do think they'll be, wouldn't that be an awesome scene, right? Like John with his last group, they're going north and like they stop by a weirwood and they say some Night's Watch oaths. Again, swear them into the watch in sort of an honorary fashion. So yes, don't forget if you're watching, please do like the stream. And once again, I will thank you guys for the increased comments, the increased level of comments on the last two streams. Both streams are doing well. Uh, the War for the Dawn Valerian stream, and especially that Winds of Winter predictions for every character stream, the increased level of comments did indeed signal to YouTube that these videos were good and should be shared with the people. So they have, they're going a little faster than normal, and that makes me feel good about life and making videos and stuff. So really appreciate that, guys. If you've been leaving a comment in the last couple of videos and you haven't before, I'm going to need you to keep doing it. And in fact, public service announcement on behalf of all YouTubers that you may enjoy. This is a good habit to get into. YouTube is an interesting medium for, you know, getting outside of corporate TV and corporate entertainment. So if you like a creator, whether it's me or Alt Shift X or Quinn's Ideas or anybody else, just get in the habit of clicking like and leave a little comment on every video that you watch that you enjoy. It really helps, makes, picks up the wind in our sales. Like I've been more excited to open my YouTube Studio. It's been the first thing I do now when I wake up in the morning is open up the comments 
because I know they're going to be mostly positive. The increased comment traffic is positive. So it's a really nice little boost to just go through there and see so many supportive comments. Even if it's just a little emoji or one sentence, you guys are filling my heart with wind, my sails with wind and my heart with joy. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't think I want wind in my heart. That could be like a some sort of medical issue. But the problem is <laughs> getting back to the matter at hand. Uh, thank you. And uh, do leave a comment and a like. So that does that is making a difference. So let's first thing that I want to say about this fair here is that we've kind of got two captains who for sure are going to be involved. John and Danny. What's the point? Okay, so J John Snow, he is the most important Lord Commander figure, Commander of the Watch, King in the North, King of Winter, leader of the forces of the North. All of these titles point to him. All, you know, to the extent that Rob is a King of Winter, he's actually foreshadowing for John. All the Kings of Winter in the Crips, it's really all about John. Um, I've talked about this in many places, but if anybody's leading the Watch and leading the fight against the others, it's obviously John. Daenerys, same deal. Why does she have the dragons to fight the others? It's pretty obvious. There's obviously more to it than that as far as beating the others, not just slaying them and burning them. That's part of the point of the whole mission to the Heart of Winter. This probably will be a magical purpose. This is where we'll see the uh, the Weirwood others magical connection come to some relevance, unlike in the show where they showed us... <laughs> You know, the children of the forest creating the White Walkers, but then it didn't mean anything. Um, I think we will have to go burn down some frozen weirwood tree or something like that. You know, something like that. Who knows what? I don't even want to get lost in that. I did. I do have a journey to the heart of Winter Stream. But the point is, John and Danny are the captains of this whole fight against the others. That's not even debatable. They're, they're, <laughs> that's what their whole arcs are leading towards. Um, so let's do some John and Danny art. Sort of. Get the vibes going here. I've got a few things. So first of all, this is Fadli Ramdani, the artist. Fadli Ramdani really does like doing the sexiest versions of our favorite characters. Here is King in the North, Jon Snow, with a terrifying looking ghost, and Queen Daenerys with a fierce Drogon. Looks like King's Landing in the background. So... That's your Fodley dueling portraits there. Jon Snow, this is another Fodley. Um, Jon Snow uh, very likely could look like this. We don't know if it'll be Longclaw, but he is going to wield a flaming sword if anyone will. And riding Rhaegal, again, I, don't, I think this is one where we don't want to overthink it. This is the basically the point of Jon being Targaryen is so that he can ride a dragon against the others, not so that he can try to be king. Um, he'll be put to the same test as Daenerys as far as you know chasing the throne or fighting the others it's just not going to be as much of a test for John because he's always been fixated on the others he already knows they're a threat so I don't think he'll be very tempted by the throne at all um his Targaryen heritage will well it'll personally it'll have an effect on him as a person because he's always wondered about who he is you know he's been a bastard this and that bastard John bastard this so knowing who his parents were it'll be important He'll definitely want to reflect on that. But the main point for the story is going to ride this dragon and probably Regal. So I do think this is very likely headcanon here that has been depicted by Mr. Ramdani. Oh, I do also want to say um, PayPal is, is awesome. If you uh, also have a super chat function, and I'm very pleased to announce the return of the super chat theremin. That one was from Mark Daniels PayPal, but we will sound the theremin, the mini theremin for PayPal's and Super Chats, as we did in the days of yore. Now back to the regular scheduled program. And let me know if that's coming through too loud. It should be fairly in the background. Hopefully it's not, uh, you know. Just let me know. The, the larger the PayPal or Super Chat, the more delay and the more uh, the more emphasis on the syllable I will do. So next up, so I like I said, oh, we're doing John and Danny art. That's right. So John, he's likely going to be a fire white. 
And this artist by Crucif, only I changed the eyes from blue to red so that he looked more like a fire white for purposes of my video. With respect to Crucif, the original artist, I do have to mod things occasionally to uh, show, to depict canon or theories. Anyways, so John, he may look like this. The skulls are all around him, but luckily he's got that flaming sword. Uh, so here, here is Fire White John. This is more like from the show, kind of. You can see Tormund on the right there, but this is a cool one for, you know, a flaming John in the middle of the battle, burning sword in hand. This is, of course, we, we showed this one last time. This is Boyan Petrov, Azor High John, with a kind of an oversized long claw. It looks more like ice wood or, or black fire or something, but super cool art. And uh, then we've got this one by Zia Taptara. And you can see she has a Patreon. This is from her Patreon. This is a cool piece. Imagining John and Danny and the dragons. See the White Walkers in the background. So this is kind of what we're going to be seeing. This is the point of their whole relationship. Don't know if they'll be having any children, but they will be saving the world together. And that's pretty romantic. So there you go. And this one is by uh, Robert Maldano. It's just another sort of Battle against the others, John with the sword, Danny with the dragon, there's another dragon in the background. You get the idea. Lots of fun things coming our way. That's this is the this is the heart of the matter. But all these other people are gonna play roles too. So let me pull down all this stuff and we'll get to our first non-John and Danny characters. Oh, and for Daenerys, yes, I I've also got this lovely piece of art, which I was gonna pair with this. So this is the one we're going to use for Danny's head here. And I like this one because it's showing Danny in some armor. And Valerian steel armor, kind of the point of Valerian steel armor, by the way, handy for if you're going to be around fire a lot. You know, you're riding a dragon in battle. The Valerian steel armor is light and very effective. But of course, you know, sometimes there things are getting hot. So I, I definitely want to see Danny in some sort of armor, dragon saddles, all that stuff. The Mighty Monarch, to hear the sound and show support. Thank you. You are welcome, sir. Let me go ahead and stir my tea and get like get ready for like I said our first non John and Danny person who probably almost certainly will be involved is, of course, Savage Sam Tarly. Yes, we know Sam's going to be involved. Sam's the only character who's killed a White Walker. Right? Um, let me just pull my notes up so I don't just um and ah here. So, first of all, he's killed a White Walker. He found the dragon glass. Uh, no, not found the dragon glass. I'm sorry. John gave him most of the dragon glass that he found. Uh, and he's Sam is the only one that sort of held on to it. So he's the he's the one possessing the dragon glass. The dragon glass itself has last hero math um, because there's like twelve, I think it's like twelve blades and one spear point or something like that. Thirteen, uh, twelve plus one is last hero math, of course, because the last hero had twelve companions. Similarly, um, after the mutiny at Crasters, Sam was the thirteenth member back to the wall only 13 people survived from crasters 12 got back and then sam arrived later so that makes him a symbolic last hero he also has parallel symbolism to cold hands when you take into account house tarley and their mythical origins from um herndon of the horn and harlan the hunter which is a reference to Hern the hunter and cold hands is essentially Hern the hunter <clears throat> Uh, check out the Green Zombies 1 for that information, or just literally look up Hearn the Hunter on the Wikipedia, and you can see how much of it applies to cold hands. It's it's pretty good stuff. So Sam having uh, parallel symbolism to cold hands could strongly imply Sam becoming whited or at least joining John's last hero watch. Um, also, Marwin says he'll be needed at the wall when they're in Old Town. We're going to talk about Marwin later. But Marwin is sort of a self-appointed general in War for the Dawn 2.0. He's coordinating forces on both sides of the world 
using the glass candles to keep an eye on everything. And he's telling Sam, learn as much as you can because you'll be needed at the wall soon. So Sam will be needed at the wall. He's got the knowledge. He's got the old books. He's got the horn. So it just seems obvious he's going to be involved. Uh, this art, by the way, is by Matt Olson Art. This one is by Esau Andrews. <clears throat> see how this tea is doing. Oh, yeah. And he's also, uh, yeah, he's with Gilly. And Gilly has baby, uh, baby, Eamon Battle Battleborn, Eamon Steel Song. Yeah, and they need they need a maesterly person at the wall. I don't know if how official anything will be because Sam will probably be fleeing Old Town. We talked about this last week, or in the Winds of Winter predictions, probably fleeing Old Town, I suspect, with the help of Alaris the Sphinx. Sphinx but obviously, Euron is coming. So Sam's either going to end up a prisoner of Euron and get to the wall that way, or he'll escape and uh, and make his way there. So... Um, okay. Uh, I've actually have two, I'm just remembering, I've got two presentations for you. I've also got a map today so that I can show you where the characters are. So real quickly, let's put John and Danny up on the board. John, of course, is at Castle Black. He's dead, Boop. but he's waiting, uh, Relorist resurrection. Um, Danny is Boop. over in Essos right there. So I've, all the Essos characters are going to be clustered down here by this red arrow. Uh, Sam, well, he's at Old Town. Boop, right there. There's Sam. So, uh, yeah. So I'll just keep uh, updating that as we go. I told you I have mad art and presentation stuff going on. Oh, yes. I hope you don't mind if I show a little less of my handsome face in favor of giving you artwork. That's about a song of ice and fire because that's what you are here for. But while I've got you on camera, I'll go ahead and take off the warm ups. I I went all out. My zippers, cool. I feel like uh, I didn't get a little bit of I didn't get a piece of cake, guy. My zippers is stuck. I cannot uh, cannot get it. It's yeah. All right, come on now. There we go. I can dress myself. Isn't that a children's book? <clears throat> In this case, undress myself. Woo! See, I'm going to blend in well in the snow. That's this part of it. See? Okay. Oh, we're going to beat the Blazers. The only question is, is Steph going to hit 16 threes tonight and get the record? But don't get me started on the Warriors. Because we're talking about the Warriors of A Song of Ice and Fire today. Oh, yes. We're staying on topic. So next up, the Night's Watch brothers themselves. Boop. They're definitely going to be involved. And this is by Chili Raven Art. And we've got Gren and Pip, Dolorised, Satin, um, John and Sam here. So there's... There's a few people that are going to be involved. We talked about Sam already. Dollar has said he's still around. He's the one who talks about the green zombies the most, right? Like he's the one who gives us all the clues about, oh, the, soon they'll be wanting us to ride dead horses and blah, 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 blah. He, most of the clues about Undead Night's Watchmen come from Dollar said. So if he became a whited watchman, kind of would make sense. He might even still be funny if he still had a sense of humor or not. <laughs> Would it get like even more morose? I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, this is We Believe Warriors. It's a bit of a throwback. Thank you for noticing. I really appreciate that. You've just made my day. Um, what? Another PayPal from Jason? How do you think John's last watch will get to the heart of winter? Dragonback Airborne Assault. After the wall is breached, sail north and strike overland. Astral projection. Oh, I like your thinking, Jason. Um, 
So I think it'll be overland with dragons accompaniment. Uh, I don't think sailing, sailing is going to be tough because there'll be no stars, um, no sun. The sky is totally dark. So you'd have to sail along the coast and maybe that's how you get close. Um, so you can't rule that out. And if we do have to sail part of the way, Davos or, or Asha Greyjoy are your two contenders. And we're going to get to both, excuse me, both of those characters in a minute. But I will I will go ahead and say overland with dragon support. And another PayPal from June. Just a big thank you, but it's a, it's a larger thank you. So let me turn up the delay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that, June. And I just saw another one roll in, but I'll wait for it to pop into my email. Uh, so this Night's Watch Brothers, like I said, Dollar said he'd make a lot of sense. Gren, I really don't have anything specific for him. He's just, you know, big, strong. It's Orox. That's Gren. So he's he's huge. Oh, is 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 Drogon getting love finally? Is is it happening? Oh, let me just let me just let me just. Actually, this isn't Drogon. What's his name? No, he's got a special name. Uh, is it on the tag or only on the paper tag? How's it not going to be on the? Oh, Grindel. He's Grindel. It is on the tag. This is baby Grindel. See, he's got gold. Drogon doesn't have gold. His flame has a little bit of gold. So this is Grindel. He lives, he's, he flies through the air. Right over there. Okay. <clears throat> We're just about at 200 viewers. I'll just remind you to click the like button if you're watching and make sure to leave a comment whenever you take off from the stream. Thank you, guys. So, Gren, who knows? Pip, same thing. I don't really have anything specific except for that he's just one of John's homies and he's still hanging around. Same goes for Toad. Um, Satin is interesting. Satin fought with John in the battle for Castle Black. He's a pretty good archer. He seems like a character that George might decide to grow into a, a, a larger role. But other than that, I don't really have anything to say about that. Um, Mully, of course, we talked about him in the Fire Whites video. He's got a lot of specific Fire White foreshadowing. So he seems he could just be a focus of that for symbolism's sake. He's not really a main character, he's more of an obscure Night's Watchman. However, because he has so much of that Fire White symbolism going on, maybe he could be like a red shirt Fire White, if you will. You know, somebody that goes with him is going to. Going to die like a red shirted Star Trek. Yeah, Satin's a good character, isn't he? Because he's, he's, you know, he's battling against misconceptions and it seems to be a lot more than meets the eye. So then we've got uh, Halder. He's a builder who's very strong and he came in in John's uh, recruit class. So I just want to mention his name. Um, Dywin, he's an expert tracker. And he's got wooden teeth, by the way, which makes him the crux of like Green Man and Weirwood symbolism in a couple of scenes. He's also the one uh, Dollar said is quoting. Dollar said says, Die one now. He says, We've got to learn to ride dead horses like the others do because it will save on feed. So I mentioned Die Win simply because of that line and because he's a tracker. So maybe he could be whited or go on a mission like this. Um, Iron Emmett is another interesting watchman. He's the wildling who became the master at arms at Castle Black. That's the one where, um, and yes, Obama is tucked in back. He's like right here. If you could, I don't know who could see that, but he is there. <clears throat> um, let's see. What else are we going to say? Uh, yes, Iron Emmett, obviously a skilled bladesman. John has that scene where he's dueling him in the yard. They're sparring. And John sort of blacks out and has a memory of being picked on when he was a kid and just beats the living crap out of Iron Emmett. And the three men have to pull him off. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I've got like rage issues. Sorry. 
And uh, so you can see Iron Emmett joining the mission. Yeah, Ed has gray hair. So it's Ed from left to right. It's Ed, Gren. Um, John, Pip, Satin, Sam. I believe John's hair is brown instead of black hair. <clears throat> but he's got the eye, the eye scar. So that looks like John. So there we go. Um, the Night's Watch. So some of these guys are going to be coming with. That's the point. We don't know how many, but it's it's literally an honorary Night's Watch mission. I have to think John and Sam won't be the only watchmen. I don't know which of these guys. Let me know who you think is the most likely. Mully is the one I've got my eye on simply because of all the symbolism. But Dollar is said is probably the other guy I would uh, I would suggest as well. Oh, Stone Snake. No, I think Stone Snake is dead. But um, I am going to mention Benjamin a little further on. So there is that. So Sam is on the board. And of course, the Night's Watch brothers are at Castle Black. I'll go back to the map in a second for that. Uh, next up is going to be Arya. I consider the probability of Arya going on uh, this mission with John to be very high. Right? Um, Arya and John have, they're the most important to each other emotionally so far in the story. Uh, you know, to each other, like John is John and Ned are the people that are the two most important to Arya. And when you look at John, he was the closest to Arya of any of his siblings. So definitely think Arya could be going. Arya will be leading the wolf pack too, at least at some point here at the end of the story. So I could see some of the wolves coming with as well, or just Arya. But Arya's skills by that point, you know, she's got all the faceless man training, she's got developed warg skill. She's definitely going to be an asset in this kind of mission. Um, and she could even end up dying tragically, but I don't, I don't think so. There is that line about when winter comes, when spring comes, it'll find you with your needle in your hand frozen or something talking about a sewing needle, but then later gets a, Arya gets a sword called needle. So that could be foreshadowing. But then there's also the quote from George's wife about like, or I think it was from George about his wife saying she'd kill me if I ever do anything to Arya, if I kill Arya. So. I don't know how that's going to work, but coming with John, I think it's very likely. And uh, shout out to Liza from Patreon. Thank you so much for your hard work and dedication. Would love a deep dive on Aria and what her role could be. Uh, what has her training been leading up to? Interested what you think about her show character versus what will happen in the books. So, in the show, it's hard because everything with the battle against the others was minimized and shrunk. Um, Arya got to stab Night King. I don't think that will happen. Anything like that will happen in the books. But I do think Arya, like I said, will be involved in the fight against the others. The, the wolf pack will be used both in battle before the long night and probably during the long night. Um, I think that. Uh, and shout out to Liza, LZA, cousin of Riza and Jizza, obviously. So obviously you're from New York and you know this guy. So that's cool. Uh, but yeah, Arya, check out King Brand 2. No, actually it's King Brand 1, uh, Green Seer Kings of Ancient Westeros. I talked a lot about Arya and the Wolf Pack and how I think that could be going. Also the Valk Arya video. That's another one. Thank you, Downtown Clowny Brown. Know my videos better than I do. <laughs> yes. So this is an interesting theory that Austin has been developing lately. Of course, shout out to Austin Flowers for coming on. Uh, this uh, is is a Song of Ice and Fire nihilistic stream that we did recently. It's a great guest. Everyone enjoyed him. Much acclaim. Austin has been talking about the idea that Jane Poole could die with people thinking that she's Arya. So when Arya gets back, She'll essentially have a clean slate. She'll be no one. She won't even have to be Arya in public. She might just be a secret agent type person. I, I like this idea. It definitely is possible. Because, um, I mean, yeah, what is, the, what is it all? 
leading up to like the faceless man training, obviously Arya is going to be in disguise. I mean, that's the only logical answer unless that face stealing stuff somehow ends up dovetailing with the skin changing magic in some way we haven't seen. But I would say she's going to be taking multiple disguises in Westeros before she ends up meeting up with John to battle the others. And that's where that's coming from. So Arya should have a big role, I would think. Um, so next up, let's actually flip over to the map real quick. So a couple of mappy boops here. Up at the wall, we have the Night's Watch brothers. Boop. And Arya, of course, is in Bravos. Boop. So uh, let's show off the Arya artwork. We've got Kayla. Um, well, why is it all got moved somehow? I can fix this easily. There we go. What about there? So on the left is Kayla Woodside. You can see Arya in front of the uh, weirwood here. If you look in the background, you can see a whole bunch of wolves in the woods. So this is envisioning her leading the wolf pack with Nymeria, which of course she will be. And on the right is probably... I don't know, is that, the dire wolf might be a little too big in that picture, but not much. There, it's going to be huge. Arya's not very big. She might be able to ride her wolf. Uh, like, I suspect Rickon will end up riding Shaggy Dog. Arya might be able to ride Nymeria. Because um, I think those wolves will be, it's already huge in a storm of swords. Said to be monstrous and bigger than the other wolves. So, yeah, the one on the right is um, Monsterling is the artist's name. Obviously, Jacqueline is her first name, but she goes by Monsterling. So there you go. What's that sound? Oh, it's the cockatoo theremin. Oh, no, it's just the cockatoo. One second, guys. Uh, I'll put the art back up and uh, go get Cleo. One second. I hate this negative reinforcement. She but she misbehaves and so she gets to come out. It's not good. But what can I do? <clears throat> All right, so uh yes. We saw Cleo very tiny in the corner. I'm sure she'll get on camera. Uh so next up is Melisandra. Of course, I won't belabor this point because we just did a whole five-part series on Melisandra. In the notes, I just have C, colon, Melisandre Secrets, one through five. She's going to be making fire whites. She's going to be resurrecting John. She's going to be helping John. She's going to, I mean, she's, everything Melisandre does is about the conflict with the others. We know that. And this is uh, by Byany, the artist. And this one is Donato Giancola, showing Mel in the north amongst weirwoods and snow. And this one is just especially creepy. I just love the, the glowing look there. So like I said, Melisandre is going to be of crucial aid in the fight against the others. Her entire life, her purpose, her whole arc, everything revolves around defeating the others in the new long night. Her search for Azor High is all in quest to defeat the others. Everything about burning children or making sacrifices, king's blood, waking dragons. Some of it's pretty dark, but it's all about trying to defeat the others. So, of course, she's going to be around. She's more than ready to give her life when and if needed. Um, so there's, there's just no way she's not involved in the fight against the others. And thus, she is very high on the board here. Next up, another witchy woman is Val. It's an open question whether or not Val has any magic. We've not seen it, but she certainly has a lot of knowledge and folkloric kind of knowledge that sounds like she 
might have grown up to be sort of like a wise woman or a witch woman in wildling culture uh, had she grown older. But I totally wouldn't be surprised if she knows a little magic. Um, I've talked about several times the idea that if Mel can practice fire magic and gradually transform herself, it should be possible to do that with ice magic. It might be at least possible for humans to use ice magic outside of the sphere of the others. We've not seen that, but there is the question of who built the wall. And if the wall is built to keep the others out, it was built by somebody that uses ice magic, but is against the others, which would be some sort of ancient Stark probably. But this again gives us the idea that non-others can use ice magic maybe. So if there's anyone in the current story that's going to bust out some quote-unquote ice magic that isn't another, Val's a prime suspect. Apart from that, she's just highly competent in the North. She knows the haunted forest very well. She comes and goes in the haunted forest at will, doesn't fear the danger. She's friends with the wildlings. She knows the woods. She... She's got the weirwood priestess symbolism because she's got the weirwood brooch, which that's more of a symbolism thing. But it does contribute to the whole witch woman vibe of Val. So definitely think Val could end up going on a mission to the north. She's, she's, I mean, her whole plot revolves around the north. She cares about the north. So I could see it. And of course, this this art here is by Morgane Lafee. Uh, the one I was just up, this is Drozinka Kimple, sorry. This one is Morgane Lafee. And this is Val making the wildlings burn weirwood as they cross through the wall. Or Melisandre making everyone burn weirwood. So there's Val and Mel staring each other down like the symbolic opposites they are. So, oh, Michael James with a super sticker. I think that deserves a theremin. But with short delay. There we go. So what do you guys think? Val's one of those ones where I know I know Morgan Le Fay is the character, but the artist's name has twisted Morgan Le Fay, so it's Morgan Le Fay. So it is it is a tweak of the classic name. I do know that much about Arthurian legend, although, as I always say, I don't know it very well. Um, so next up, after Val, let me know, do you think Val's going to go? I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought maybe yes. Um, but we'll have to see. It depends on where, where the wildlings go, because I could see her sort of moving with the wildlings to try to keep them governed to some extent, keep them safe. So next up, we've got a couple of very likely characters. Actually, before that, let me get a couple of PayPal's that came in, and then we'll tell you about Jamie and Brienne. Mr. Mulder says, if John's Dirty Dozen are whited, or if the Night's Watch will become undead, does this mean all those people will not make it to the end of the story? If the others are defeated and their magic is undone, will the undead Night's Watch also cease to be? Um, very possible, very possible, Mr. Mulders. Uh, I say it is possible. Um, most of the people that are going to become whited, probably that's their final, that's their last bit. Um, once you go whited, you, you, you don't go back, I guess. I'm sorry, I didn't even want to make that joke. But once you're undead, you're undead. That's it. So... Yeah, I don't think any of the people, when you become a white to fight the others, it's a sacrifice. You're giving, it's it's basically the Night's Watch sacrifice on steroids. Like, when you join the Watch, you give up a lot of things, right? Your former life, the ability to have kids, the ability to marry, all that stuff. So, essentially, the original Watchmen being undead people is just all of that, only more so. Cold Hands has given up everything to become this perfect weapon against the others. Same thing for John. So I do think all the people that become whited, 
they are essentially giving up any hope of a regular life. So I don't know if they'll just, if they'll all die on the quest or if all the whites will fade out at the end of the story or if they'll just be stuck in the north. I do not know. Do not know. But they don't, uh, They it will be their final act one way or the other. So Dylan Fairbank <clears throat> says, finally caught a live stream. No question. Just want to say thank you. Well, you're welcome, sir. Oh, I wanted to do this. Sorry. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> it's been a minute. I'm a little rusty. Sorry. You got extra mojo there, Dylan, for your PayPal. Thank you, sir. So next up, I can already read the comments. Your Thurman's annoying, man. We should just talk about the story. Okay, so. Next up, as I said, is Mr. Jamie Lannister, the Kingslayer. Boop. Jamie Lannister. Well, he's a handsome fellow, or at least he used to be. Doesn't have a hand anymore. It's getting a little haggard. His golden hair is turning silver and white. It's turning into a white lion, a snowy lion, if you will. He's wearing that winter raiment of the King's Guard. Mainly, there's two things here with Jamie. First of all, he has the dream with Brienne where he dreams of wielding a flaming sword down in the depths of Casterly Rock. We've talked about this endlessly. Sam Hogg does the art on this one. Not only are Jamie and Brienne wielding flaming swords, but the King's Guard that Jamie is confronting are described more otherish than any other King's Guard description. They're ghosts, they're trailing mists, they don't make any noise when they walk. Um, so this is snowy armor, it's all there. This is the most otherish the King's Guard ever appear. And they actually are undead. These are dead Kingsguard. These are ghosts, just like the others are ghosts. And so, will Jamie and Brienne wield flaming swords against the others? Seems likely. Uh, they've got one Valerian sword between them, Oathkeeper. And we don't know, you know, Widow's Whale's in King's Landing, just sort of sitting there. But obviously, you could see Widow's Whale get into brienne's hand or jamie's depending on who has Oathkeeper, either one i guess jamie with the left hand maybe would would take the smaller sword at this point uh <clears throat> any case this dream is foreshadowing if anything is so here we got jamie uh this one is this is a fadly ramdani jamie so it's extra extra you know hairy and handsome that's fadly style and then here's Aransa Sisteo. This is Jamie and Cersei in that scene. That very problematic scene where they make love at, <laughs> right next to Joffrey's corpse. Yeah, and it's, it's semi-consensual. And, and then, yeah, yeah. It was worse on the show, obviously. But uh, these are a couple of messed up people for sure. In any case, just want to show the art. It's obviously amazing. But Jamie is up on the board. He's most likely going to be involved in the fight against the others. The other point about Jamie, besides the dream, is that redemption arcs have to go somewhere. Right? So if Jamie is to become honorable, if you will, how is he supposed to do that? Seems like a good way would be heading north to fight the others, right? Kind of fits. It's him and Brienne both, I think. And that doesn't mean he might not come back down and strangle Cersei at the end or something like that. I don't know if he'll strangle Cersei first and then join the watch. Not sure. But I do think Jamie will be doing that. And uh, also point out, Jamie has a, a golden hand. But of course, hands of gold are always cold. So Jamie actually has a cold hand. So will he become a cold hands? An undead Night's Watchman? Could be. Could be. I also think uh, Jamie should come face to face with Bran. Yes, Shauna Bass. Not sure exactly if it'll go similar to on the show, but 
that def- that moment does need to come full circle. Jamie coming back to Winterfell, something having to do with the brand and the Starks. Yes, I agree with all that. So that would be cool if it was undead Jamie killing Cersei. Yeah, that'd be super dark. Why not? I have to think about how that would fall out, but. That's Jamie. So let's flip over to the map and put a couple people on the map. We left off with Arya. So Mel, of course, boop, she's at the wall waiting to resurrect John. Val is boop, also at the wall. And Jamie, boop, he's down in the Riverlands with Brienne. Boop. So there it is. And next up is Brienne. Choose your fighter. Brienne is a good fighter. She's a very good fighter. Already showed that one. And she has Oathkeeper. Oathkeeper is, of course, a Valerian steel sword that used to be ice. And as we discussed on the Valerian steel War for the Dawn stream, Ned's swords really do have to get used against the others. It just makes too much sense. Not only are they Ned's swords, they've been turned red and black. And, of course, Lightbringer had a red blade. So... Ned's swords have been turned into two swords. And they're dyed red. And one of them is in the hands of Brienne. Brienne is a very valiant character just by deed and by creed, by moral statute, but also because of her symbolism. She has the morning star, even star symbolism of Venus with House Tarth. They have a rising and a setting sun. And um, her... The, the ruling lord of Tarth is called the Even Star. So that would kind of make Brienne the Morning Star because the Morning Star and Even Star give birth to one another in a cyclical way. And then, of course, um, she's also got the Venus symbolism of uh, being Brienne the Beauty. That's another Venus reference. And then she's carrying a sword which looks like Lightbringer, which of course is based on Venus mythology. So she's just got Venus and Lightbringer symbolism everywhere. It's saturated her character, her house, her weapons, her name, all of it. So it would just kind of make sense if that was all headed in the direction of her becoming a soldier against the others in the War for the Dawn. So this is so far all these characters that I've named are people that could go with John on, you know, John and Danny on this last mission to the heart of winter. Um, but it's also possible they could just be involved in the fight against the others elsewhere. But these, the people I'm listing first are mostly people that I, like I said, good chance of going with John on that mission behind enemy lines. It's going to be dangerous. So next up, um, next up we have Sandor Clegane, somebody who's kind of connected to both Jamie and Brienne, certainly connected to George's commentary on knighthood. And this one is by Pro Crick. I know most of us think of uh, the actor that played Sandor, Rory McCann, a great Sandor, a great actor, really enjoyed him. I Definitely think of him usually when I think of, of uh, Sandor. Um, Book Sandor is a bit younger, though. He's scarred, but he's like early 20s. So he probably does look a little more like this pro crick image here, where it's like he'd almost be handsome in a cruel way if it weren't for the fact that his half his face was burned. And then this one is by Michael Comark. And this is, of course, Barrick and Sandor in their famous sword fight. Um, give me a, a 30 seconds, guys. I just got to grab something.
Yeah, 23 to 25 on Sander, I think. So, um, Sander, why is, what are the clues that he'll be involved? Well, he's got the hellhound symbolism, which is actually a mirror to the symbolism of the Starks. The Stark direwolf is a hellhound. It comes from Cerberus. It guards the realm of the undead, the crypts. So, Sander is basically an honorary Stark. Um, he might end up being something like a sworn sword for Sansa Stark if and when he leaves the Quiet Isle. I definitely think that could make a lot of sense. Um, Sansa lost her wolf, and so she'll get a hound to defend her instead. Um, and I like the sworn sword concept. Seems cool. Sanders already kissed by fire, right? Um, so as he's burned, so could that foreshadow becoming a fire white? Would probably be sort of traumatic for him, I guess, but it could be foreshadowing um, just that he will fight the others or that he'll become a white, either one. Um, Sander is also the epitome of broken and reborn characters, right? And I think um, this is something, a key thing we should look for in our heroes. George really likes to do this. He likes to break characters down, break down their ego. He likes to scar them up. He likes to take from them the thing that is most dear, whether it's Cersei's hair or Jamie's sword hand. Um, and, 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 you know, strip them down to nothing. Danny begins there, basically, you know, she's the heir to a throne. She can't get, she's blood royal, but she's being sold as a slave. <clears throat> so George loves to take characters, break them down and rebuild them. Theon is another one. He's the epitome of this. So I do think that characters who have been through this and come out the other side, Jamie hasn't gotten there yet, but he's probably headed there are definitely ripe to be tools of the old gods and to find a higher purpose of fighting the others. So Sandor, having gone through whatever he's going through on the Quiet Isle, he might fit this bill along with Theon. Um, Jorah, if Jorah ever comes back around, that'll be the story for him. He's at a very low point right now with his demon mask. And we'll get to Jorah in a minute. Yeah, the hound is the grave digger, and that that's that's in uh that's in Brienne's POV that we get that information. But yeah, look that up online if you're not hip to that theory. Uh, so that's Sandor. Um, oh yes, also uh, Sandor fought in that duel against Barracks, you know, burning sword with quote the cold one. So one idea that we had, if um, you know, if if Gendry knows how to reforge Valyrian steel, if he learned it from Tobo Mott, it could be that we're heading towards a scenario where ice gets reforged. Kind of makes more sense to have two separate swords, yes. But ice is, you know, a very important sword to us emotionally. And if it were reforged and rededicated to the Starks, well, who's going to swing that thing? It's a great sword. It's huge. Sandor could swing it. He's big enough. And if he is Sansa's sworn sword, he could wield a Stark sword on behalf of House Stark. So that's one thing that we talked about in the Valerian Steel stream. A little bit tinfoil. It's not likely, but I just want to throw that out. Um, he could also... I mean, if a sword like Heartsbane is collected from, you know, Randall Tarly, Sander is the kind of guy that somebody might stick it in the hands of just because he's a big, huge dude. So if he's going on that mission... And all the Valerian steel is headed towards being used. You know, he could handle one of the big ones. So that's Sandor. And uh, yeah, that's all the notes I've got on him. So next up is going to be Blackfish. Brendan Blackfish Tully. He has an obsidian fish fastening his cloak. Just like have my little obsidian necklace. It's sort of a, I guess it's a spear point. An arrowhead. That's what it is. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Sorry. Arrowhead. <clears throat> so Blackfish Tully, he was Rob's top general. His bona fides are unquestioned. Let me put up the art here. On the right is Antonio Manzanedo, and on the left is Miguel uh, Regadon. So it's good. 
solid blackfish art here. Well, well represented. So it could be that we should look for one member of all the the uh, the seven kingdoms, if you will, the various regions. We need a Riverlander, and we need someone from the Reach, and blah, blah, blah. Well, someone from Dorne. Dorne's the hardest one to do, by the way. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, you know, I missed a really, just remembering, I missed a really generous super chat a minute ago. I don't want to give it. It was from Martin. Just a few coppers. And it was in a uh, foreign currency, which I always find amusing. So. All right. I probably overdid that. In any case, I do appreciate it. I, I let it go. So I, I was trying to make up for forgetting. That's what I was doing. Yes. So Blackfish, his bona fides are unquestioned. He's a great warrior. He was Rob's best general. He understands tactics. He's still limber and spry and sneaky. He snuck out a river run. He can swim, obviously, very well. Um, he's just, he's like kind of a black ops dude. And we're going to talk about uh, another guy like that uh in a little bit but uh, uh glover robert glover it's another kind of black ops northern allied guy yeah ned dane perhaps he's a bit young dark star we'll talk about those guys but not likely i don't think yeah dorn is <laughs> almost everyone all the dorners people are gonna be dead before the time before the long night falls i think but getting back to blackfish Highly qualified. He used to have kissed by fire hair, or at least red hair of some kind. Uh, so there's that. He's got the obsidian fish, like I said. And his credo, family, duty, honor, would potentially compel him to join this fight. You know, he's he's the kind of guy that where he would see the greatest threat and potentially sacrifice or risk his life in service of the realm i could absolutely see that happening so i don't know what the odds are on blackfish being in john's group um but if he survives this long he'll definitely be like i said a general somebody that would be in charge of a fighting force could maybe be in charge of resistance preparing castles you know take command at a certain location if the war against the others really does spread out and we have multiple fights. Yeah, and, and now his hair is snowy looking. So he's gone from kissed by fire hair to snowy looking white hair. Exactly. So that could all be symbolic foreshadowing for becoming a fire white, a night's watchman in service of Lord Snow. Yes. So... Um, he's going to kill the dead things in the water. I like that. Yes, it, the Tullys do have fish man armor, as you can see on the picture on the left, is uh, faithfully depicting. So that's the Blackfish. Uh, Blackfish, of course, last seen. Well, let's put Sander on the board. Sander is over our, by the Quiet Isle, boop, somewhere near Crackclaw Point. And the Blackfish, last seen escaping from River Run, and is probably operating in the West getting ready to spring Jane Poole and some of the Stark captives. Check out the uh, Lady Stoneheart Winds of Winter preview I did with Quinn for more on that. But he's he's escaped. He's on the loose somewhere, causing trouble against the Lannisters. He might potentially, if Stoneheart is compelling Jamie to uh, pull some sort of deception to give River Run back to the Tullys, you could see Blackfish become involved in that plot line as well. So next up, let's Mance put on your red cloak. It's Mance Raider. Mance Raider, as I always say, just too awesome of a character to get rid of and to let die. If I'm if I'm George Martin, he's in Winterfell right now, a potentially a prisoner of Ramsay, but maybe not. Maybe he wrote the pink letter and he's hiding out in the crypts. He was looking to get into the crypts before 
when Theon was there and Theon pretty much showed him the way or gave him the right clues before he left. So it's likely that Mance may have found his way into the crypts or will uh, when he escapes. He's definitely not just going to die like a chump in a cage. Like the Lord of Bones did. Glamorous Mance Raider. No, no, that will not happen. However, that symbolism is interesting. The Lord of Bones burned inside of a weirwood cage. So burning inside of a weirwood, that could be fire white zombie symbolism. So that could be a way of indicating that Mance will become a fire white. He'll be a burning weirwood soldier like Jon Snow. But most of all, he's got a strong connection to Jon, basically one of Jon's father figures. He knows the North very well. He's a great fighter. He's very smart. He's an experienced commander, unified the North. So he's if he's not going with John on the secret mission, he's definitely a, someone who could be a general. Um, you'd, you'd probably put him in charge of the wildlings. You know, whatever wild, wherever the wildlings are when the long night falls and we're fighting the others, Mance Raider, Tormund, Val, these are people with enough cachet with the wildlings to command them. So you could see him playing that role if he's not going with John. Uh, Mance Raider genuinely cares about protecting people and stopping the others. He's been doing it for a decade. That's why he's organizing the wildlings to bring them south of the wall. Um, and let me put up, oh, sorry, that's Torment. Where's my Mance artwork? So this one is, this is by uh, Lucas Jaskolski. And this is, of course, glamoured as the Lord of Bones with Melisandre and John here. Here's actual Mance by Diego Gisbert Lorenz. Mance in all his glory with his raven-winged helm. I love Mance. He's, he's a top five character for me, no doubt. No doubt. So I, I may be wishful thinking here, but I desperately want Mance. I want his story to continue, and I want it to be awesome. He's just an awesome character. So either going with John or commanding people, I think one of those things. Um, like I said, he has been organizing the wildlings to keep them safe from the others. He was bringing them south of the wall to hide from the others, which he succeeded in doing. You know, ultimately, all of his efforts and the impression he made on Jon Snow led to Jon making that decision and bringing the wildlings through the wall so that most of them are safe for the time being from the others. So... Mance is someone who genuinely cares. Once he get, gets free, he will be down um, to, he will be down for this fight as much as anybody, as much as Jon Snow, really. Um, and of course, Mance used to be a Night's Watchman. So this is a former crow comes home to roost. It's a redemption arc for Mance if he fights with Jon against the others. Um, but this time, he'll get to keep his flashy cloak. So everyone's happy. I like this idea very much, obviously. I'll move along. Enough Mance. Mance fangirling for me. So Alex Mars pipes up with a super chat. Thank you, Alex. You got the short delay. What about Woon Woon? He has to be involved in a fight. Well, he's he's already involved at the fight at, at the wall. Uh, if he survives, which he probably will, he's a giant. I definitely could see Woon Woon going on this. I probably should have put Woon Woon on here. Uh, I did bump up against a limit at a certain point. But yeah, Woon Woon, that's definitely a possible. I mean, who wouldn't want a giant going with you, right? I mean, it's kind of shaping up to be a little bit of a, tropey fantasy quest kind of a thing so yeah maybe you need a giant and a dwarf I, we're going to talk about Tyrion later but yeah maybe maybe that's what you need like a giant and a dwarf and all the classic shit <laughs> a wizard um we're, yeah maybe a marwin will come he'll be the wizard uh so <laughs> so yeah wound wound that's a good suggestion So after Mance Raider is Torment. 
He, like I've already, I've already mentioned, he's someone with enough cachet with the wildlings to command wildlings. He also has an emotional connection to John. Um, <clears throat> you know, John, he was with John. It, they were, they made plans together right before John got assassinated. So when John is resurrected, Tormund's probably going to be right there. Uh, so he's, he's definitely going to be involved in the fight against the others. And he very well could go with John to the North. He knows the North. And again, if you're doing a, a tropey, questy kind of a thing, you need you need the comedic relief, right? So if it's not Dollar is said, it's got to be Tormund. And again, we have the question of, does someone retain their sense of humor when they get whited? Potentially, that will be a question. And here's Jolly Tormund eating some chicken, as he's known to do. If you go back and read that first Tormund scene, he actually takes an extra chicken and just stuffs it in his pocket. He takes this greasy chicken right off the thing and just right in the coat pocket. That always gets me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm not quite a germaphobe, but I'm definitely always like, you know, washing my hands a lot and thinking about stuff like, like, oh, don't put the chicken. Worse, you need some tinfoil, man. Some Tupperware. Can we get Tormund some Tupperware? Anyways. Mythical astronomy of ice and fire, folks. Unique brand. It's a unique brand of analysis we have here. So, yeah, Tormund, very likely to be involved. And let's put these folks on the map. Got to go up north. Mance, of course, is at Winterfell. Boop. There's Mance. He's at Winterfell. Tormund, meanwhile, he's up at the wall. Boop with Val and John and Mel and the Night's Watch. So next up, we're going to go very far north, and I'll just put this fellow on the map right now. Cold Hands. Yes, Cold Hands almost overlooked the obvious. But if John is going on a ranging north of the wall, and Cold Hands isn't dead, I mean, Cold Hands might have given his life to get Bran in the cave. That's possible. We might have seen the last of Cold Hands. Swinging an iron sword against whites and buying time for Bran. But I suspect he's not dead. And if he's not dead, of course he's going to help John. <laughs> of course he's going to help the humans that are going north of the wall. So we could see cold hands show up along the way. And now it's put up the great cold hands art by Blue Ultramare. The seven of cold. <laughs> the seven of colds. That's him. Lucky number seven. And of course, uh, <clears throat> we've got this offering by Diego Gisbert Lorenz, whose name I've said a couple times, depicts cold hands strolling merrily in the woods, being friends with the children of the forest. Really good children of the forest, too. Here is This is a good, very good animalistic, cat-like, deer-like looking children of the forest. Pretty awesome. So, yeah. Cold hands could easily show up and be involved. He's foreshadowing for John. Maybe he'll join up with John. But like I said, he's already up there. So if he's not dead, <laughs> he's not quite dead. <laughs> a couple times over. If he's not all the way dead, it would kind of be hard to have a mission in the North without cold hands. So good chance the cold hands will be involved, I'd say. Next up, less likely, what about Benjen? What about Benjen Stark? Now, on the show, Benjen Stark was cold hands, of course. And we know that this is not the case in the books. George has specifically clarified that. His editor scribbled in the margins when cold hands appeared. It said, Benjen, question mark. And George answered, no, underlined, no. However, if Cold Hands, I mean, if Benjen is not dead, what, like, what could George possibly be saving him for? Um, Benjen might have been, sorry, um, my art's out of control. Jason Jenicky shows Benjen hiding the dragon glass that John found at the Fist of the First Men. That was either hidden by Cold Hands or Benjen, right? One or the other. 
and I would I would say probably Benjamin. It could be either one, really. So very good chance Benjamin is dead, and we'll only ever see him as a white or not at all. However, could be that the others stole him and turned him into a freaky other because the Starks, you know, they have other blood, and that's what they want to do to John. But wouldn't it be cool if he was still up there? Either alive, you know, with Stone Snake just living off the land, or maybe he's been maybe he's been whited. Maybe he will be like cold hands by the time we see him. I'm not sure, but one of the reasons George probably had to hide Benjamin from the main story is that he knows all the RLJ stuff. So once RLJ is revealed, which will probably happen in the next book, it may be that then Benjamin is allowed to come back on screen. And that's that's why we haven't seen him on page, if you will. So I don't wouldn't call it likely, but if Benjamin is still alive, the most logical conclusion for his story would be to end up helping John in the north. So I've got uh <laughs> Smiling Benjamin and uh, where, are, where where they started and where are they now? Yes. Beloved Benjamin. But seriously, it would be cool. I mean, it wouldn't totally break. It wouldn't be like too storybook necessarily. Uh, but... It would just be a cool way to bring him back into the story and give us an answer. Because we really have been hanging on that one forever. I mean, he disappeared early on in book one. And we've just, just been wondering since then, just hanging for like 25 years. So, Next up is Mira Reed. Oh, it looks like I skipped somebody's picture. Oh, Cold Hands. Let me put Cold Hands' picture up. There we go. Hi, hey, girl. You doing all right? Yeah, she is doing all right. So Mira Reed, she's with Bran in the cave right now. So while we're up north, we'll go ahead and put Benjen and Mira on the map. There's Benjen. Boop. He's somewhere in the north. I put him up by cold hands. We don't know where he is. He could be anywhere up there. And then Mira, she's up north, you know, obviously in Bran's cave, which is where we last saw cold hands. So I put those characters up there. Mira has already survived the North once. Um, so be <laughs> the kind of thing where like, well, we got to go North of the wall again. And Mira's like, oh, I don't want to do that. That's the last thing I want to do, but I guess I have to because I'm a hero. But maybe she won't want any more to do with the North at all. But she may have dark sister. As we talked about, George has confirmed that Blood Raven had dark sister with him when he disappeared or when he went to the wall. So it's probably in Blood Raven's cave. And if Hodor is going to die sacrificially at some point in a hold the door type thing, then it pretty much leaves Bran and Mira coming back from that cave. So Mira is the one to wield Dark Sister. Dark Sister was made for Visenya originally, it was for a woman's, not for Visenya, but for a woman's, uh, it was made for a, a woman warrior, a female warrior, essentially, with the size and the weight. When it was first carried by Visenya, also carried by Daemon Targaryen and Blood Raven. So let's not overly gender the sword or anything. But the fact that it was carried by Visenya, you know, it means that it's definitely the kind of thing we could see Mira or even Arya end up wielding. But if Dark when Dark Sister first comes back from the cave, Mira's going to be the one that has it. So she's got a Valerian steel sword. She's in the north. She knows about the threat. She knows about the stakes. Jojen's death has to mean something. So you can see how Mira might be involved. Also, uh, we're going to talk about the Tower of Joy fight as symbolic foreshadowing. Because, of course, Ned is fighting with Grey Wraiths. They would be the Night's Watch. They're fighting against the Kingsguard, who symbolize others very often. Lyanna is an Ice Queen figure. So it really does seem like a Night's Watch versus the others kind of battle. Now, of course, Ned the Stark in that battle. He was aided most significantly by who? Howland Reed, right? The Cranog man. So if that's a last hero type of scenario where Ned is playing the last hero role, well, it's going to be John playing that role this time. 
So if he needs a Cranog man to help him, well, how about a Cranog woman? How about Mira Reed? If not Mira, it would just be Bran himself playing that role. Um, Bran's not a Cranog man, but he's small and he's a green seer. So he could serve as the Howland uh, parallel there, but it could be Mira. So let me put up the Mira art. Sorry, I, I should have put that up earlier. This one is by Maji33. This is actually Howland, of course. And then this one is by Hoon. It's H-O-O-O-O-O-N. But it's very good. So there you see uh, Mira on the right and her dad Howland on the left. The Reeds are loyal to the Starks. That's how they're introduced into the story. So Mira going with John could make sense. And there are those theories about Mira and John being twins. Um, Mira might also, I prefer the one that Ashara Dane is Howland's wife, Diana Reed, which would make Mira half Dane. And that would make it even more likely that she would be involved in the fight, uh, the War for the Dawn. Outside chance. She's not big enough to wield Dawn. So I don't think that's where the potential ashara reed theory could be going but if it is true it definitely makes mira more likely to fight the others so next up stannis that's right stannis we think we know the next couple of moves in stannis's story let me put up my stannis art um well so first of all stannis has already ridden to the wall to defend the kingdom from a threat from the north. So if he joins in the fight against the others, that's just a redux of that. He's foreshadowed himself. Uh, he's been talking about the others for a long time. That's part of the whole Azor high bit and everything that Melisandre is telling him about. So wouldn't it be great if he got to wield a real flaming sword? Um, we also know that Shireen Baratheon is going to have some tragic death somewhat similar to the show probably melisandre and selice will burn her for some magical reason i've said many times that i don't think stannis's story can end without him coming face to face with that because he's very much going to be responsible when that happens even if he's not there so stannis at the point that he realized he's contributed to the death of his daughter who he certainly loves very much um he's going to be in a very low place. So he could join the watch out of, you know, sort of atonement and personal penance, or he might accept that um, as a sentence if he's found guilty or to be part in, you know, crimes like burning children. I don't, I don't think that's as likely. More likely he'd be taking it as a penance or just because he knows this is where the fight is. But uh, I think that one idea I had on the Valerian Steel stream that I want to repeat here is that actually, no, this wasn't. This was in the comments. Somebody left a comment asking what sword Stannis might wield because his sword is not Valerian Steel. It's just a glamour. Well, how about Heartsbane? Sam's not really built to wield Heartsbane. But if all the Valerian Steel swords are going to get collected, Heartsbane's definitely going to be one of those. Sam might well, it's actually in King's Landing, Heartsbane. It's with Randall Tarley. And all the swords in King's Landing are probably going to pass into Fagon's possession and then potentially into Danny's possession. So if somebody's going to wield Heartsbane, why not Stannis? He obviously has all the stag, fiery heart symbolism. I mean, think about it. His sigil is the fiery heart. It's a burning stag, and a stag is a heart, H-A-R-T, inside of a burning H-E-A-R-T heart. Like, pumping blood heart so he's a fiery heart twice over so if he were to wield heart's bane and have it get lit on fire we're all going to look back at that and be like of course symbolism and stuff so there's my theory somebody give that man a real flaming sword and heart's bane kind of makes sense so that's my stannis theory and here's another one uh, let's see this. Sorry, this art is by Zeon Cat. It's the first one. This is Alexander Dainchi, and that's Stannis at the wall. And then we have Jack Kaiser, evil Stannis, possessed. 
His life fires are being drawn low, Stannis. Very cool. Flaming heart heart. Yeah, exactly. So next up, we've got Theon. Theon has become an instrument of the old gods, as we've talked about many times. His name literally means an object belonging to the gods, an object instrument of the gods. Uh, he His plot is increasingly becoming tied to the Starks and Winterfell, and really it always has been. He potentially can still shoot arrows. So, and he is a good archer. So if you give him some dragon glass arrowheads, not unlike on the show, he can still be useful in a battle. Um, he probably will be looking for rehabilitation. He may, you know, I'm not sure where the whole Bran Theon storyline is going, but it's possible Bran may be able to keep communicating with Theon. Theon has Grey King symbolism, which is sort of undead green seer symbolism to sort of be brief there. Theon also strongly associates himself with the comet. And on the left, we have Theon art by Kep Treffler, and on the right, by Logan G. Theon's hair is now white. That is canon. So Theon associates himself with the red comet. He's, I mean, many people look at the comet and think all kinds of things, but he, he does look up at it and think, oh, it's my comet. It's the sign for you know, my victory and blah, 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 blah. And Theon's obviously delusional and egotistical when he's a young man. But what if what if that is foreshadowing for him being on the Azor High Watch? <clears throat> so I don't know if he can hold a flaming sword. He's definitely down some fingers. Perhaps a knife or, like I said, the arrows. Some dragon glass arrows. So I don't think it's super likely that Theon will be on Jon's mission. But he probably will be involved in the fight against the others somewhere. And if Theon's involved, that means probably Asha is going to be involved because at this point, I think Asha and Theon will travel together and then she'll be protecting him. And on the right is uh, Asha Greyjoy, art by Steamy. And on the left is Michael Ivan. Hey, thanks, guys. Super generous on the PayPal today. Really appreciate that. From Cinnabarb, I like the idea of, oh, right on time. I like the idea of Asha somehow getting back to the Iron Islands for a POV. Um, the notes John got from Hardhome said there were dead things in the water. And without the sun to guide the ships, they would all be trapped. It would cause a breakdown of the islands in a few months since they don't grow much of their own food. Uh, recommend reading Collapse by Jared Diamond to get an idea of how this could happen. So, yeah, I've read that. I love Jared Diamond. <clears throat> I might have that book on the shelf, but I can't remember. So I'm not going to dash over and do the dramatic book reveal thing. But, yes, Jared Diamond. Good fellow. So, yeah, I was wondering how much, what's the limit of navigating by compass without the stars to guide you? Could a sea, could an experienced sailor get from the Iron Islands and back? Oh, Theremin, please. Yes. Ooh, that was spooky. So it's either impossible or only possible if you're an experienced seaman or sea woman. So Davos, Asha Greyjoy, that's your short list of people, maybe Blackfish, I guess who could potentially navigate to hard home or north of the wall or to the Iron Islands or anywhere like that. So, so Asha could play an important role just for that, whether or not she, uh, you know, joins John's last watch. See person. Thank you, downtown. Yes, see person. You with the uh, ambiguously gay duo looking <laughs> cartoon of Batman and Robin. That's cool. See person. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, hang on.
So let's see here. Anything else to say about Asha? She's currently in the north with Stannis. And in that battle, let's put her on the map. In that battle, she has a Nissa Nissa weirwood sacrifice, almost death. She's backed up against the tree and the roots are ensnaring her. Think of a green seer stuck in the roots. And then Morgan Little bashes her on the head and she blacks out. And she imagines herself going to the drowned god's watery halls. So into the green sea, if you will. It's a whole Nissa Nissa symbolism thing. So that could just be symbolism for telling us the story of Nissa Nissa. Or it could actually be a clue about Asha having to do with the Weirwood plot line, you know, more directly. Again, if Theon does, then Asha could too. Uh, so let's put her on the map. Well, let's put a few people on the map. Stannis, boop, he's north of Winterfell. And with him are Theon, boop, and Asha Greyjoy, boop. Another person up there is Moore's Crow Food Umber, boop, and the aforementioned Morgan Little and several other mountain clansmen loyal to the north. But the two I want to talk about are Moore's Crow Food and Morgan Little. So let's put this Crow Food artwork up. So Morris Crow Food, he's the one that has the dragon glass eye. A crow pecked out his eye, became Crow Food, and then he uh, did he eat? Did he bite the crow? Was it? Did we get the Ozzy Osbourne reference? I can't remember if he ate the crow. But uh, in any case, he put a dragon glass hunk in his missing eye. So that is obviously tremendous symbolism, right? Obviously, Dragonglass is the chief weapon against the others besides Valerian Steel, assuming that Valerian Steel slays the others, which is an assumption that we're going on. So a guy with a Dragonglass eye definitely could be somebody that wants to go north. Also, he's kind of representative of the Northmen who are ready to die. They're ready to go out hunting during the winter to leave one less mouth to feed so the young people can make it through the winter. This is a northern tradition. So if he, he's, he's, he's already sort of bringing up that logic when they're talking about marching on Winterfell in the snowstorm and all the Northmen are basically like, quit your whining. And Crowfoot in particular is like, yeah, I've seen my last winter. You know, I'd rather die, you know, bathing in Bolton blood, blah, 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 blah. So he may die in the Battle of Winterfell, very likely. But if he survives, then he could go north. Morris Crowfoot is also the one who was leading all the green boys outside Winterfell, digging pits and blowing horns, playing tricks on them. So more symbolism. He's blowing horns. That's a big Night's Watch thing. The horn that wakes the, the sleep, uh, sleepers. Yes, you, <laughs> you south run jack and apes. And then leading green boys. Green boys and graybeards is green zombie symbolism. The, the Night's Watchmen start off as green boys, they end up as gray beards, but the green men were part of the original watch, it seems like. So then you'd have green men who die and come resurrected. So Moore's Crow Food leading a bunch of green boys could be clues about him joining the watch. The, the new recruits on the watch are called green boys. Like that's the most often place you hear that phrase. So. He already leads green boys. Kind of makes sense. So Morris Crowfood, if he's around, would want to go on such a mission. That's basically what I'm saying. Now, Morgan Little, he's the one who keeps piping up about Ned's girl when they're talking about marching on Winterfell to save fake Arya, who they think is real Arya. So he could become, if Arya surfaces, either fake or real Arya, he might become her champion or sworn sword. And more, I'm thinking about real Arya here um, when she comes back. Morgan Little. Morgan Little is the one who almost killed Asha and then later apologizes for calling her the C word. So he's kind of, 
I guess my point is he's gotten a couple of scenes now. George could be developing his character a little bit. Um, Bran also meets a little on the way north. It's that guy that he meets in the cave and then shares a little bit of food and fire and then disappears in the morning. That guy had a pine cone brooch, so that was a little. So the littles know that Bran is alive, is the point. And that was probably either Morgan or his younger brother. So it probably was Morgan Little that Bran met. But in, in any case, all the littles would know about Bran's existence. So he's kind of an important person. Only a few people know about that. Um, also, the, the Duncan Big Little, the oldest, uh, Morgan's older brother, he's already a ranger of the watch. Uh, and the littles, um, the other brother's named is Rickard, and their father's name is Torin. So they're naming their, their family members after Starks. They're joining the watch. So Morgan Little is a guy, again, he's more kind of a red shirt if he goes on John's mission, but uh, definitely a guy, if, if it's, it might not be 12 main characters, you know what I mean? There could be a couple of guys that are lesser known just to make it seem realistic. So Morgan Little, he's the kind of dude that could end up there. But let me put crow food up on here. Crow food. And here is the sigil of House Little, just to give them a little respect. There's no Morgan Little art, but there is his sigil. So next up is Davos. I've already mentioned Davos a couple times. He's one of the only people with the skill to pull off any sort of sea travel during the long night. I also, more importantly, think that his his literary role in the story is he's the Jiminy Cricket to Stannis, right? He's the conscious of conscience conscience of the king. And I definitely think he could play that role for John as well. And I think that um uh oh somebody's mentioning that uh there's a theory that Val could be the daughter of Crow Food, Moore's Crow Food Umber. So that would be cool if that's a true theory then we could see that pay off if they were to reunite in the fight against the others. That would be a cool little obscure bit of sort of plot loose end tying together that he might do. <clears throat> but yes, Davos is one of the only ones capable of a sea voyage. And like I said, he's been the, he's been Stannis's Jiminy Cricket. So perhaps he'll play the same role for John. He is a good hand of the King and seeing it happen on the show did make sense. So that could be something they got from George or something that just seems intuitive and logical. So I don't know if he'll go with John on a uh, on foot to the heart of winter, but he might drop him off somewhere on a boat if he needs to. And otherwise, he'll certainly be involved in the fighting. So next up is Robert Glover. And before we talk about Glover, let's put um, Davos on the map. He, of course, is on Skagos. So he's got to, he's got some travel to do before he can get back to the lands of the living. Just check my tea here. Oh, it's delightful. Yeah, Swagger Dagger, you got it. Secret Agent Man. That's that is Robert Glover. So you might be saying who? <laughs> who? <clears throat> so this is actually uh, this is by Nacho Molina. This is actually a different Glover, but I'm using it for a standing because it's the only Glover art I could find, and it's got his sigil and a scarlet cloak that the Glovers wear. It's a mailed fist. On Scarlet is their sigil. So it's an interesting one because the fist is, it's that rising smoke cloud symbol. But being on a field of red, it kind of gives you that fiery hand, bloody hand symbolism. Or you could just see the red cloak and think of Reloris and stuff like that. But before I get to that, let's just talk about who Robat Glover is. <clears throat> 
He's he's been in and out of prison a whole bunch. <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, he's the wife of Cybel from Deepwood Mott. Uh, Cybel Glover is the one that Asha is talking to in her scenes at Deepwood. When Asha takes Deepwood, she takes the two children of Asha and Robet back to Ten Towers as sort of royal, well-treated hostages, if you will. But Robet Glover, <clears throat> he's one of Rob's sort of generals, but he gets he gets played by Roose Bolton at Duskendale um, and captured by the mountain. But before that, he was um, he was among the Starks at Harrenhal that Arya helped free. So he was a prisoner at Harrenhal too. Um, and then Arya helped free him with the weasel soup. She wasn't sure if she could trust him, but she was thinking about telling him who she was, and she didn't. She helped free him, and then uh, Robet worked with Vargo to bring uh, Amory Lorch down and turn the castle over to the Starks. Although, of course, Vargo Hote then went his own way, sort of. <clears throat> so then he gets, when he gets captured by the mountain at Duskendale, he's released in a prisoner exchange uh, on a ship, and he takes a ship to White Harbor. Then we see him in that scene where Davos, uh, where Manderly sort of shows Davos his real face. Davos has been imprisoned in the Wolf's Den, and it's actually, uh, it's Glover that comes and gets him, I think. And then it's Glo uh, Glover and, da and Davos and Wyman all talking. And basically Glover's been plotting with Wyman because uh, they've, they've found Wex somehow. And Glover is the one teaching Wex to write so that Wex can communicate to them. But Wex, uh, that's, it was, if you remember, that's Theon's, I think a squire. It's like a 10 year old boy who can't speak. He was with Theon at, during the fall of Winterfell. He hid up in the heart tree and saw the whole scene with Maester Lewin and uh, Bran and Rickon separating and all that. So he knew, he knows that Bran's alive and he drew a picture essentially communicating that to Wyman and Robert Glover. And now Glover's teaching him his letters. So the point is, Glover is kind of a secret agent man. He's kind of like James Bond. He's sneaking all around. He's probably the hooded man in Winterfell. It's definitely the best theory for who the hooded man is, in my opinion. And the hooded man, of course, is a mysterious figure that confronts Theon out in the yard, calls him a kinslayer, and says the North remembers what he did and all this stuff. Kind of rattles him and then lets him go. Uh, but he's, he probably, it makes sense for him to be the hooded man because he was with Wyman at White Harbor. And then Wyman comes to Winterfell to launch their plans to take down the Boltons. So if Robet's either there or tagging along, you know, somewhere outside of Winterfell. But he's probably in Winterfell on the down low. Hence, him being the hooded man. Um, there was a Glover with Ned at the Tower of Joy. Ethan Glover. <clears throat> and so, they are. Very, it's a very stark, northern, loyal house. And Robet is a badass. So, that's basically what I want to say. He could end up being a general... Or he could even end up going with John to the north. Kind of, he's well qualified. He's not really emotionally linked to John, but he's qualified to go on such a uh, <clears throat> on such a mission. So that's him. And like I said, he is probably hanging out at Winterfell. Boop. I put him in between White Harbor and Winterfell because he could be anywhere between there but he's almost certainly at Winterfell. In fact, he's the kind of guy that might spring man's raider for all we know. You know, I mean, he's, he's behind the scenes doing God knows what to cause trouble to the Boltons. So he's definitely a, a loose, loose cannon, free agent, however you want to say it. <clears throat> a difference maker, a wild card, an X factor, as they say in a sports ball game. So that's cool. Robert Glover wanted to get him on there. Next up is someone with a much higher percentage chance of going with John. We've talked about him already. 
It's Sir Jora. Scarred, <laughs> demonic looking Jora with his demon mask tattoo. Yes. Um, and of course, there's a couple key things here. It does seem that he's headed for a redemption in the eyes of Daenerys. George has him hanging around in Slaver's Bay with Tyrion and Penny. Tyrion's obviously, his plot's going to intersect with Danny's. So not sure how it happens, but Jorah probably gets let back into Danny's service. Now, Gior Mormont, Jorah's dad, Lord Commander Mormont, the old bear, his dying wish to Sam Tarly when he was bleeding out on the floor of Craster's Keep was to tell Jorah to take the black. Dying wish, okay? Even said, tell him it's my dying wish. Just like a parent, right? Leaning on you to uh, carry out their will, even after they're dead, putting putting their expectations on you. Well, it would make sense, though, because, of course, Jorah disgraced his name and his family by, you know, trying to sell a couple of poachers as slaves. Slavery is outlawed in Westeros. Danny's very anti-slavery, so... I don't know what that has to do with one thing or the other. Point is, Jorah disgraced himself in the eyes of the Westerosi and his father in particular. So honoring his dad's request, once he hears about it, seems intuitive. If Jorah wants to come home, that's that's what he talks about. That's what he longs for, his home. So it really seems elementary here. I, I, I'd call this 90%. We're going to see Jorah taking his dad, you know, taking the black, honoring his dad's wish, and I really think that John will give him back Lawn Claw. Because it's a it's a Mormon sword to begin with. And John is probably destined to wield Dawn, I would say. But perhaps Oathkeeper or Widow's Whale, one of the Stark swords, because he always thinks about ice and desires ice from when the time when he was a child. Or he could even wield Dark Sister, because he has so many Damon and Blood Raven parallels. And they both wielded Dark Sister. So there's lots of swords John could wield besides Longclaw. So I do think he'll give Longclaw back to Mormont when he takes the black and goes with John on this mission. So I do think it'll be somewhat like the TV show in that he'll be on the mission there. There'll be much buddy-buddy talking and throwing it up and who knows what. As you can see, actually, that let me make this point. Just look at the top line of people here. There's a lot of women. Arya, Val, Melisandre, Brienne, Daenerys herself, of course, Mira. You know, these are all people that are pretty likely to go. So we could see a pretty diverse group instead of the uh, the bro team that we saw on the show. I'll just throw that out there. And yes, obviously Jorah is creepy with young Danny, no question. That's why he was disgraced and humbled. He he had that coming. Uh, but George does believe in redemption arcs, and I do think the circumstances are just aligning too neatly. So I think that's coming. Uh next up is, and we're going obviously we're on the Danny contingent now. Gray Worm. Gray Worm. And this art is by Ryan Valet or R Valet, as it's as he sometimes goes by. Gray Worm. So it's kind of a simple case here. He's Danny's top general. He goes wherever Danny goes. So could obviously make sense if Danny's going on this mission to the north. Gray Worm would probably be like, you know, take me with you. I'm going. I, you know, you can't go without me. I will protect you. So. And Danny's probably going to want somebody like that, that's totally loyal to her, comforting to her, familiar to her. Definitely some of Danny's people will be going. Grey Worm really does make the most sense. Also, I'll point out that the Unsullied have certain parallels to the Night's Watch and the others in that they are a brotherhood who can't have children. Obviously, they weren't given a, given a choice. Uh, neither are some of the people sent to the Wall. Neither are Craster's sons, I guess. 
Um, so it's not an exact parallel. Uh, obviously, you don't want to compare anything to uh, mutilation uh, that the unsullied go to go through. But nevertheless, it's a fighting force of men who can't have children. And that's the same as the watch and the same as the other. So kind of makes sense if you see Grey Worm join the Night's Watch. Also, as I've mentioned many times on uh, Born to Burn the Others, Danny burning slavers to free the unsullied seems like foreshadowing of Danny burning others to free the whites. So if you had an unsullied on hand, it kind of would just be a poetic resonance there. But mostly it's just because he's, you know, he owes everything to Danny. He's super loyal to Danny. And he probably would not choose to leave her side unless she told him to. So let's put a couple people on the map. Sir Jorah. Let's go down here. So Jorah, obviously, boop, he's in the east with Danny, as is Grey Worm. Boop. <clears throat> Somehow Danny's square got misaligned. Ah, that's so much better. Oh, I feel better. Okay. So next up, I'm going to put a bunch of people on the map. Um, we're going to talk about several people from the east. Victorian, Brown Ben Plum. Actually, let's just do those two. Victorian and Brown Ben. So Victorian, many great artworks, which we've used many times. He's got the fiery hand. That's the main thing that speaks for Victorian. And also the idea that we might need, you know, one person from every kingdom. If there's no Theon and Asha, who's the ironborn? Well, it could be a Victorian if he lives that long. Most likely he'll die before then. But he does have that burning hand that Makoro made him. And that thing is running on R'hllor power. So it may very well have the ability to light a sword on fire. It may be able to burn whites. He may be able to choke choke strangle whites with his burning hand. I know it sounds a little comic booky and tinfoily, but he does have a magical fire hand and we do have ice demons in the story. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Right <clears throat> now, most likely this is just something that George, so George can show us that relorist magic can modify physiology. Maybe we'll see other people that are actually fighting the others get fire hands along the lines of Victorian. Or maybe just, it's just a fire white thing, but Victorian has a fire hand. So I just got to mention it. And on the left is Hallstein, Mike Hallstein. On the right is uh, Connor Burke, the artist. And uh, this one is by Amulia. And last thing about Victorian, obviously he has the dragon binder horn and he's bringing it to Danny. So he's, you know, going to be Danny's ally for the foreseeable future. And he's got these, He's got this big Valerian weapon. So perhaps that's something we're going to use in the battle to the north. And let's put Victorian on there. So next up is going to be Mr. Ben Plum. It's only this one artwork of Ben. And I'm not even sure who it's by. Oh, it says it on the bottom. Patrick McAvoy. So the main thing about Brown Ben is that the dragons like him. Uh, he's been caught up in chicanery, you know, with the second sons jumping back and forth. So got no idea how that's going to shake out. Danny might just burn him and have a dragon eat him or something. But <clears throat> he's definitely a developed character. He's one of the characters in Marine that we know the most. He's got a lot of ties to Westeros. The dragons did like him. Uh, he's met Tyrion. He's with Tyrion right now. So... I do think he'll be coming back into Danny's sphere. And he is also a commander. So less likely that he'd be going north on a last watch thing. But if he lives long enough and comes back to Westeros with Danny, he could end up being a captain in said fight. I should have put Woon Woon on here instead of Ben Plum, though. I'd say Woon Woon is a higher likelihood. So apologies to Woon Woon. But there we go. That was Brown Ben. So next up, uh, Makoro is also in the east. And the fiery hand. Well, there's a couple of fiery hands that were on uh, Tyrion's ship. 
I think they got washed up to sea. Oh, they they showed up in the um at the slave auction in Slaver's Bay. So there's a couple of fiery hands that made it to Slaver's Bay. More importantly, though, Danny's probably going to stop by Volantis on the way back and uh, burn some slave masters. And they're gonna. She's probably gonna trigger uh, a slave revolt there, which will be led primarily by the Red Temple and other other factions like the Widow of the Waterfront. Most of the slaves are worshippers of Relore, and they're already preaching against the slave masters inside the Black Walls because Relore sees Danny. I'm sorry, not Relore. The Temple of Relore, the the Volantis, Relores, Benero, and all them. They think Daenerys is. Daenerys is Azor Ahai reborn. And they are pointing at the black walls and saying how they're evil because they're they're lying with the other slave masters and sending forces against Daenerys. <clears throat> so Danny honestly is probably going to come back to Westeros with a whole mess of fiery hand soldiers. Probably the whole thing. Probably all the Reloris. I mean, why else do you make the fiery hand, a bunch of temple soldiers, and then sit there and prophesy about the return of Azor High Reborn, if not to send all of those soldiers <laughs> with Azor High Reborn when he shows up. Like, what What are you waiting for? So probably Danny will come back with all kinds of Reloris. You know, there's always a thousand members of the fiery hand. So I think we'll get all of the, we'll get all 1,000 coming back to Westeros. Let me put up this, uh, the artwork for these last two people. So here is Makoro by Mike Hallstein. <clears throat> and here's Makoro by Akazagat. And here is The Fiery Hand by Ertak Altanaz. I'll go back to Makoro. But here you see some fiery soldiers over lore. Now, that we don't have any, any clues that the, that the Fiery Hand or anything other than just soldiers holding spears and dressed up in red and orange armor. However, given that the fire white magic is a red temple practice, meaning they give everyone who dies in their temple, they give them the last kiss. And it's just that in Westeros recently, the last kiss has started resurrecting people, but that's an old Reloris tradition. So it could be that if the Reloris come to Westeros, and the red comet's back and the end times are upon us, that we'll see a whole bunch of fire whites that the, the red priests and priestesses that come with Danny will be turning all of these suckers into fire whites. Um, that is, that is entirely possible. We could see a bunch of them. We definitely will see the, the fiery hand in Westeros <laughs> really looking forward to the uh, culture clash between the, the sparrows <laughs> of the seven and, uh, and the red We'll see how that goes. Theological debates. And, uh, conversations so plenty but going back to Makoro he's an interesting one um let's see here let me just check on something real quick as well Cool. So it looks like I'm up to, I have not missed any super chats. That's good. And let me check on the PayPal's. I think I'm up on those as well. Yeah, I think I see a couple hit my phone that haven't hit the email yet. So if you just sent one in, ah, there it is. Okay. From Jelena. No question. Just a thank you. Well, you're welcome. All right, so Makoro. Makoro is interesting. Again, all of these Reloris believe in the cause. They believe the others exist. They believe the Long Night's coming. They believe fire magic and Azor High is, and dragons are what you need. Makoro is seeing visions of dragons. He's all over it, so... Obviously, there's a lot of plot between Mirene and Westeros. We don't know what Makoro's role is, but he's a very powerful red priest. He survived 10 days at sea. So he's he's potentially even further along than Melisandre on the fire transformation. And also people have speculated that Makoro's burnt black-looking skin, um, you know, 
which is spelled out to be darker than the summer islanders but like actually a burnt looking that could be what melisandre looks like underneath her glamour potentially so aj says thanks for the streams and the fun chat thank you aj you're quite welcome so makoro again law lots of plot in between westeros and slaver's bay but he's very powerful he has a knack for staying alive and once Danny heads to Westeros, there's no reason for Makoro to stay in Slaver's Bay. So he definitely could be coming with Danny. He could end up being a general or even going north to fight against the others. He might be an inhuman Melisandre type with all kinds of fire magic, fire white raising potential. So he's a total wild card. George could do nothing with him or everything. He could die off soon. He could become Daenerys' right-hand red priest. So he's definitely going there to become Daenerys' red priest. So I definitely think we've got to see some amount of that. So I, I really hope Makoro sticks around for a while. I do like Makoro. I mean, he's he's pretty freaking cool character. Um, I'd like to see him get developed more. So Makoro's, let's put him on the board right there. I'll put the fire hand on the board. <clears throat> All right, we're getting through it. Next up is Marwyn the Mage. Like I said, every good quest needs a wizard. And Bloodraven's going to be dead soon. <clears throat> and Marwyn the Mage, well, he's already a self-appointed general in the War for the Dawn 2.0. As I said, when Sam meets him, he's like, okay, Sam, tell me everything you know. I probably know it all, but I might have missed some small detail. And he's been using the candle, the glass candle, which th that's my glass candle uh, mock-up on the right, by the way, which I did in Photoshop. Marwin the Mage has been using the glass candle to keep an eye on Sam to the point where he basically knows everything that Sam has done. Fist of the First Men, the Whites, the, the Mutiny, all of it. He knows all of it. He, that means he's probably watching Jon Snow. He's probably watching all that shit. Then he tells Sam, all right, well, now I got to get on a boat and go see Daenerys and help her. So he's one of the only people that sees both sides of the puzzle. He sees the others in the north, and he sees Danny and the dragons. And he's like, okay, these two things need to come together. Very short list. And it pretty much might only be at this point uh, Quave, and Marwen that that have their brain around the entire picture like that. And they both might be Starry Wisdom Church members, by the way. They both probably are, in fact. Check out my Great Empire of the Dawn Church of Starry Wisdom stream for, like I said, a very deep dive on Marwen and Quave and their Starry Wisdom affiliations. But the point is, Marwen is already taking charge. He's sending sam here he's going to help danny he's using the glass candles he's obviously going to bring one of the candles to danny so that they can use it there and continue to keep an eye on everything so he's potentially the most valuable ally that danny has he also could have lost dragon knowledge just like Tyrion. he's an archmaester of the citadel with a valerian rod ring and mask which actually the mask might be helpful and so the rod too right boop some others on the head with that valerian rod uh but the point is even the ring is cool your little captain planet action going or something um in any case marwin has studied the higher mysteries that's how you get uh to be the arch he's literally the arch maester of the higher mysteries that's how you get the valerian rod ring and mask he studied in a shy for years so there's no limit to the knowledge that George can put in his head. Anything Danny needs to know that Quaithe can't explain directly, Tyrion and Marwyn could pretty much fill her in. So this guy with the glass candle is going to be teaching Danny how to use it. I have a feeling Danny's going to trust him and he's he's going to become one of Danny's top advisors. And I don't see him dying in quick death in Marine. He's coming back to Westeros. So 
I love Marwin the Mage, and I don't know how far north he'll get, but he's definitely going to be in Danny's camp whenever she goes, you know, ends up at Winterfell or the Wall or wherever it is, having war plans and waging war against the others. I expect Marwin to be caught up in that for sure. Ladies love the Valerian Rod, you guys. So another one that is in the East with Danny is, of course, Tyrion. Tyrion's an interesting one to think about. He is a sneaky sort of fighter. I don't know if he's a good fighter, but he's been in a few battles, and he kind of tends to stay alive somehow. So <clears throat> he's, you can't rule out Tyrion going with Jon on this last hero's journey. Now, specifically, there's a lot of talk about Tyrion joining the Watch in a Game of Thrones. Mormont saying, we need good men like you on the wall and all this stuff. So Tyrion coming back and joining the Watch in an honorary fashion really would make sense for a few reasons. And he's got a very strong emotional connection to Jon. So obviously he's going to come back to Westeros with Danny. But I also think his story could take him all the way north to the Wall with Jon. <clears throat> and again, every quest needs a dwarf. So perhaps Tyrion will actually be on Jon's watch. And uh, he, his favorite weapon is the axe. We're not sure how big the Celtigar axe is. But maybe Tyrion can get his hands on the Celtigar axe. If it is that we're going to have 12, 13 Valyrian weapons for this last watch at the wall, then that's his weapon, the axe. So... There is a Valyrian steel axe out there. Now, currently, he's with Jorah uh, in the Tent of the Second Sons. Uh, the last start, by the way, was Jason Engel. And this is Jamga here. <clears throat> so he's in Slaver's Bay. He's going to be on Team Danny. Let's put him up on, put him up here on the map. There's Marwyn, boop, and Tyrion, boop. And that's pretty much the Eastern contingent. I didn't mention Dario. Because I just don't think Dario comes back to Westeros. Everyone would laugh at him, really. I mean, with hair, the mustachios, just wouldn't go well. People wouldn't appreciate the Dario style. But Westeros is too small-minded for Dario Naharis. <clears throat> now, that being said, he is also very loyal to Danny for his own, you know, reasons. Obviously, he has he slept with Danny, and I don't know if you'd say he's in love with Danny or whatever idolizes her wants to possess her who knows but he does seem genuinely loyal to her um he's currently a prisoner of war in Marine, and i think uh barristan's set to possibly you know break him break him loose team danny's definitely winning that that battle so it's likely dario will survive the battle <clears throat> now he's a badass fighter so perhaps he'll just stick with danny and he'll he's just a fighter but Really, I, I don't think you want Dario around when the John and Danny stuff goes down. It's be kind of awkward. So I kind of think Dario's going to stay in Slaver's Bay. But if he doesn't, you never know. I mean, he certainly knows how to wield uh, weapons. And there's a couple of Valerian steel Auracs laying around. One of Dario's weapons is an Arac. He has an Arac and a stiletto. So never know. I didn't put him on there, but it gets an honorable mention. Another uh, honorable mention level guy is uh, Sir Loris. Um, I almost didn't put him on here, but he was recently burned with wildfire on Dragonstone. So we've talked about the burning and the kissed by fire red hair as being potential clues that somebody's going to end up a fire white. Well, Loris is burned and he's burned on Dragonstone. So it kind of puts him in the same category as the Hound. Used to be a Night's Watchman. I mean, used to be a member of the uh, the Kingsguard. The Kingsguard, thank you, yes. Loris is still a member of the Kingsguard. Um, <clears throat> but he could end up being an ex-member of the Kingsguard. We don't know how that's all going to shake out with the Lannisters and the Tyrells and Fagon and all that stuff. But Loris has been marked. Yeah, Allegedly, that's true. That could be a total lie. That is very true. We don't know if it actually happened. But supposedly... He was burnt with burning oil and he's on Dragonstone near death. So assuming he doesn't die, 
he could end up being a burnt warrior. And maybe, just maybe, he'll be, you know, involved in the fight against the others. I don't think he would go north with John, but he could be involved. He could stick around long enough. And he also does have all that blue rose symbolism in, in the uh, jousting with Gregor. He's essentially serving as an Ice Moon Leanna figure in that fight. Um, it's it's mostly symbolism. Don't think too much about like romance or sex or anything there, but he's decked out in uh, blue flowers uh, that are called forget-me-nots. And <laughs> I've, I've joked uh, that the forget-me-nots could be called promise-me-neds. You know, that's kind of similar, the whole, the phrase. Um, Leanna and the Blue Roses, promise me Ned, Loris and the Blue Flowers, forget me not. I don't know. It's a thing. So there's symbolism there. It's a weak case, like I said. We're, we're at the bottom of the list. But the, the Blue Rose symbolism combined with him being potentially burnt on Dragonstone just made me wonder if George is doing something there. Because remember, the Long Night is going to end all of the feuds of man. The Game of Thrones kind of disappears when the Long Night falls. Everybody's in it. The you know everybody's. It's going to be dark everywhere. You're not going to have to convince anyone that the Long Night has fallen. Right? <clears throat> it's going to be readily apparent. Everyone's going to know what it is. And if the and if you got to think like everyone knows the stories of the long night. So when the sky goes dark, people will probably start wondering, oh gosh, are the others going to come? You won't have to convince them. If you show up and you're like, yeah, they're coming. We fought them already. You notice the sun has been hidden for two weeks. <laughs> All the Twitter feuds will be over. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> I've left my Tyrion art up here. While I talked about Loras, sorry. Here is Sword Loras by Michael Comark. And here is Sword Loras by Jason Jenicky. <clears throat> a little more effeminate Loras on the left, but of course, that's kind of how he's described. He's as beautiful as a woman. So there you go. Pretty, pretty awesome art, to be honest. I think it's pretty, pretty good. Both of these, Comark and Jenki. It's more <laughs> romance novel Loras on the right. <laughs> so there's Sir Loris. Um, last but not least, actually, yes, last and least, Sir Heil Hunt. He's just kind of hanging around. So, like, literally, he's hanging from a noose <laughs> when Brienne yells sword. So I don't know if he's alive. He might be dead. But maybe they cut him down with Brienne. And he's going to be involved in the whole Bri um, Jamie and Brienne plot line. And if that's the case, maybe he'll end up in the fight against the others. He is kind of a sneaky, like, redeemable character, I think. Um, you know, obviously he was involved in the cruel tricks against Brienne. Um, and that's, that is what it is. I'm definitely not minimizing that. But he was younger. And I could see him growing up a little bit especially after Brienne's essentially saved his life, if, if that's what happened. So we'll keep our eye on Heil Hunt. Somebody suggested that on Twitter, and I was like, sure, we'll mention Brienne. But I do have to say that we've mentioned a couple ones like Wound Wound that are, that are more likely uh, to happen. Somebody just asked about um, Grizzly Meadows, asked about Timmet, son of Timmet. I did not include Timmet, uh, but that's, not, that's certainly not crazy. Um, <clears throat> he's, you know, I think his arc is mostly a veil centric arc, but he does have all the delightful weirwood symbolism and he leans the burned man, of course, as I mentioned in the fire whites and fire whites watch videos. So much like Mully, this is a character that's been used to give us symbolism about fire whites and undead knights watchmen. So perhaps he'll actually become one. Yeah, I could see that. Timid son of Timid also just kind of rules and would be a great fighter. I mean, why wouldn't the some of the mountain clans have representation? Because I, I really do feel like George is going to show us that. Like the long night, everybody's on the same team. So I do think we'll get characters we never imagined together coming together and having some pretty interesting scenes. <clears throat> so yeah, you never know. Yeah, Timid is a red hand. Exactly. He's got 
a lot of uh, weirwood and relorist symbolism. Tim, it deserves a theremin. Yes, he does. Thank you, Minty. That was a pretty good one. All right. That was for Timmit. So here we are. <clears throat> so this has been um let's see, what did I call this? I'm about to screw up my own joke. I'm gonna pull up Twitter here. Yes, um, uh, Dawn Fighter 2 Champion Edition. That, that's what this is. As you can see, this, this does resemble the uh, Street Fighter selection screen um, because uh, actually, <laughs> this is no joke, last night had a Street Fighter dream. These are like work dreams that you have. I played so much Street Fighter 2 when I was a teenager that every once in a while, I will just have a dream where I'm just playing Street Fighter 2. So. I also have Guitar Center dreams occasionally because I worked at Guitar Center for like six years. So yes, um, random David Lightbringer trivia. I will kick your ass <laughs> with any character in Street Fighter 2. Oh yes. Don't come at me about Street Fighter 10 or any of that shit. I'm talking Champion Edition, Street Fighter 2 Turbo at most. In any case, there we are. So what I can see when I step back from this <clears throat> is that, like I said, everybody is going to be involved in this fight. This is a fight for the stake of humanity itself. And it's interesting how many capable people there are that George has created. They've come from all walks of life, but everybody has different skill sets that they can offer. And most of these people are highly competent in more than one area. <clears throat> so I don't know who's going to be on John's group. I don't know who's going to be leading, like I said, groups of human fighters to defend various castles and stuff. But there's a lot of people here. There's commanders. There's people who can sail. There's people who can wield swords. There's people who know how to sneak around. There's people with magic. There's people who know the haunted forest. Most of these people have been proven to care about the state of the world and some of the ones that don't could be on a path to care now victorian he's i don't know what well <laughs> victorian's motives are his own but most of these characters are characters who are either in a place or coming to a place where they're ready to put it all on the line <clears throat> to try to fight the others so yeah, it's, it's been a really fun exercise. And what what again, what struck me the most is just how many characters are shaping up to be the kind of competent fighters, you know, that could wield Valerian steel, have the courage necessary, have different pieces of the puzzle, either knowledge or power wise, fire magic, people that can ride dragons potentially. So I don't know how George is gonna shake this out, but what I do know is gonna it's gonna be <clears throat> a lot more entertaining than what we saw on the HBO show. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <clears throat> it's going to be, uh, it's going to last longer than one night. I would expect the long night to last at least a couple of weeks of book time before anybody can solve it, which means the, the others will probably penetrate into Westeros. There'll be multiple battles. But these are things that we're going to cover in a future live stream. That's right. We've come to the end of today's stream. And next up, <clears throat> this Sunday, is going to be War for the Dawn 2.0, The Ancient Enemy. And I'll share my artwork with you real quick. Build the hype. But we're going to talk about the others. Everything we know, everything we think we know, strategies, what it's actually going to be like. There's a lot more here to say than you think. Um, so this is going to involve strategies. I might get into uh, the children of the forest and the green seer role in this as well. We'll see how far the notes take me. Um, one second here.
There it is. Now we'll stop. I've only got about 13 windows open here. Stop sharing this one, and I will share the art. It's by John Jude Palancar. And there it is. This will be Sunday's stream, War for the Dawn 2.0, The Ancient Enemy. So now that we've outlined the fighters who will take on the others and the weapons they might use, it's time to think about what it's actually going to be like to fight the others. Um, the TV show gave us a couple of clues about what it's going to be like, but this is something that like, you think you know, but you don't know. When you put it all together and you start thinking about what it will actually entail, it's going to be nuts. So that's that's this Sunday. And I've got a couple of generous people still sending me PayPals. Thank you, friends. So let's see what we've got in the question department. <clears throat> From Dan. Oh, a very generous PayPal. I love your YouTube videos, man. They continue to scratch an itch for the last decade. Let's hope George gives us more content soon. Yes, that that's uh I'm doing it as hard as I can. <laughs> and then let's see, we've got also Ah Natasha, another generous super chat. More theremin is coming. No question, just theremin. So here's no reverb. Let me show you what it actually looks like too. So it's this little, it's not a real theremin. It's basically a toy theremin, but a real theremin has a vertical and horizontal bar, and you can move your hand up and down like this and hit the pitches very accurately. This is just a noisemaker, but. It gives you some of the joy of a theremin. And then you put the delay on. It's basically some outer limits shit. So thank you guys for sending me PayPals and Super Chats. You must like the theremin. I got more than usual, so the theremin shall continue. Uh, it's, it's made by High Watt. I don't know if they still make it. It was like 15 years ago from Guitar Center, but that's who makes it, just for what it's worth. Getting a real theremin is fun, uh, but that's a whole different thing. It takes a lot of skill. In any case, I will see you Sunday, folks. I have answered all the questions. I guess I didn't call last call. Let me just call last call. If you have a question that you think I should answer before I end the stream, speak now or leave it in the comments. And I will say again, please do leave a comment on your way out. But yeah, last call for questions if you got them. Oh, good call, David. Theremin should only be played while wearing aviators. Yeah, for sure. It was totally a 70s thing. So that's uh, that's actually the case, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, well, let's do this. Let's flip back over to our map real quick and just look at where everybody is. Oh, not video. Shit, I hit the wrong button. No. Cancel. So flip back over to the map. Did I boop everybody? Nope, I didn't boop Loris. Boop. He's uh he's there. He's near Dragonstone. Heil Hunt. Boop. He's uh, with uh you know in the Stoneheart Cave area. So here's all of our fighters. You can see a lot of them are up north already. Cold Hands, potentially Benjen and Mira, Val, Tormund, Mel, John, the Night's Watch brothers, Davos over on Skagos. <clears throat> See the Winterfell group, Crowfood, Umber, Morgan Little, Asha and Theon, Stannis, Mance Raider, Robet Glover, potentially. You can see Arya on Bravos headed back to Westeros soon. 
And you can see how close it is, too. It's really not far. She could show up in Westeros anytime. George might not show us either. We could just, one Arya chapter could end, and then a few chapters later, she's going to be the background character in a scene through somebody else's eyes, and we won't know it's Arya at first. <clears throat> Get ready for that. Uh, we got Blackfish there in the Westerlands. Sander hanging out at the Quiet Isle. Sam's in Old Town, and a bunch of people over in the East. Makoro, Tyrion, Marwyn, Jorah. <clears throat> we didn't mention Strong Belwes. That's another of Danny's fighters that could end up, you know, caught up in this mess just because he's tagging along with Danny. Uh, Belwes is hard to kill. He ate all those peppers and didn't die. <clears throat> and uh, he wheels an Arak, and there is a Valerian steel Arak floating around. So, Kago, corpse killer, who, by the way, could get killed himself uh, and his weapon taken because I don't think he's pro Danny. So, he's with the Windblown, which is Tattered Prince's uh, cadre. So let's see here. Um, yeah, Belwis and uh, oh yeah, Dornish. There's really not um, there's really not too many Dornish that could have a chance of being involved. It seemed to me <clears throat> like the Sand Snakes. They're all going to be wrapped up in the King's Landing plot line, and Obara is the only warrior, and she's not even in King's Landing. She went down, you know, to beard Darkstar in his den. Um, Darkstar. I really think he's going to get killed so he can pass on Dawn. He's way too dastardly to actually join the watch and fight the others. But who knows? Maybe George is going to pull a twist there. You know, Ned Dane, outside chance. He's just too young. He's valiant, but he's too young. <clears throat> I guess I didn't mention Gendry. Gendry is probably one I should have put in there. Um, I did like seeing Gendry and John sort of bro it up and be like, hey, Robert and Ned's kids, uh, our dads, you know, they were friends. That was awesome. Gendry could be a good fighter. You know, I like him wielding a hammer. I loved all that stuff. It was kind of fan servicey, but I dug it. So didn't mention Gendry, but he definitely could be involved. Uh, where was he last seen? I guess at the end of the crossroads, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Alaris the Sphinx has the best chance of living the longest of any of the Sand Snakes or Dornish, probably, because I think Alaris the Sphinx, aka Sorella Sand, is going to help Sam escape from Old Town, which means that, and also Alaris has been uh, sitting in on Marwyn with the glass candle, so she knows about Sorella, she knows about this, the others, and the threat. So she's probably the Dornish most likely to be involved, actually. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up and enjoy my Warriors game at 7. And I will see you on Sunday with another War for the Dawn 2.0 stream about the others and how to fight them. And no, I did not include Cotter Pike. Um... Yeah, he is probably doomed. I guess he could be someone else that could undertake a desperate sailing mission, but yeah, I'd be surprised if he if he if anybody survives hard home, really. So all right, guys, thank you much. You've been a beautiful audience. And like I said, I'll see you on Sunday. Please leave a comment on the way out. And thank you for doing so in, like I said, higher numbers the last couple of streams. That has